You, your name is on the wall eight times here. Eight times. And as you yeah, look at that... I, I haven't even seen this, you know, I never noticed it before. Come on. Well, these hallways at Queen's Park would be all too familiar to a guy named Bob Runciman, who was an MPP here for almost 30 years. He was a senior cabinet minister as well, and interim leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. He's got a new memoir out called From Mad Dog to Senator, and we're going to go have a chat with him right now. He gave a nice little speech. And Said he didn't agree with everything in the book, but... <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. He might have agreed with what you said about Bill Davis, though. I want to start on the very first page of the book, which in some respects is typical, but in other respects, it's about a subject that I think very few people would associate with you, Mad Dog Runciman. Yeah. Because you tell us on page one that you see a therapist. And people from your generation uh, often don't do that. No. So, how come? Well, it was really uh, surrounding the, uh, the death of my wife. And uh, we were married for 56 years, and she was not just a, a huge part of my life, but also of my political career. I mean, she was a, a natural as a political spouse. I don't think you could get any better in that role. And, uh, and because of the circumstances of her death, she was uh, terminally ill, but uh, she died as a result of an accident. and. Uh, I just had a really a tough time coping with it, and uh, so I started to see a, a psychologist, and uh, you know, and I would occasionally tell her stories about my political life, and she uh, was more or less fascinated by these stories, and she would often say, you know, Bob, you should be writing something about this, and then finally she said, Bob, you know, I think this would be great therapy for you. You don't have to publish anything or whatever, but just start writing these stories down. So that's what I did, and uh, it kind of uh, grew from there. Well, let's start telling some of these stories, because your political career goes back more than 50 years. You started as a, I guess your first victory was on Brockville City Council yes. as a 30-year-old. And you write in the book that you say you thought your heart was going to burst right out of your chest <laughs> when you had to speak at council. And again, that is not the Bob Runciman that I think most people think they know. So what's going on there? Well, I think uh, I'm, I'm very much, in, I've kind of grown out of it to a significant degree, an introvert. And, uh, and uh, I was not a, a natural public speaker. I, I tried to become one. I, I took uh, courses in public speaking and all that, but I still, I, I, I don't think I became really uh, uh, comfortable in terms of getting up and, and speaking uh, without notes and, and uh, talking about issues that way until we were uh, in, uh, I guess it was the 87 election. After that, we were down to, I think, 16 members. You guys got wiped out in that election. Yeah, we did. And so we were the third party, and, uh, and a few of our members were uh, reluctant to speak, and they ended up not running again. So there's a handful of us that had to carry two or three portfolios and speak in the House all the time. And you've been an MPP for six years already at this point. Yeah, and I, was, I had gotten used to it, but that really... In terms of when you're in government, you're, you're usually speaking to prepared notes and prepared texts. But when you're in that role, you didn't have the staff to work on that kind of research. You had to do a lot of it yourself. And you would have newspaper articles you would quote and then sort of expand on them with your own views or your, hopefully your party's views. Well, I got another example of this because 1981, which is, is, that's your first election, yes, right? For, was, yeah. for Queen's Park. You ran for the PC nomination in the riding of Leeds. And apparently you are so nervous when you have to give your speech, you sneak out of the hall and have a couple of belts of vodka. Yeah. Same thing, just nerves? It was nerves. I was, uh, you know, a basket case. And uh, so, and I don't know whether that actually calmed me down or it was just the idea of it. But uh, when I get up to speak, I put my notes aside and stood beside the podium. I, I had it memorized. I'd read it and rehearsed it so many times. And it, I think, you know, I got a, enormous positive feedback after that. This is the one guy who can do this sort of thing, but <laughs> they didn't know the backstory. But, uh, but no, I, I was, uh, I was quite, a, I, you know, I see these young guys nowadays and, uh, and uh, just, you know, in their 30s and you can just get up and talk about anything. And uh, that wasn't me at all. I had to, I had to learn the trade, if you will. You know? So when you won in 1981, the premier of the day was Bill Davis. He had just won his fourth straight election. Yeah. What did he think of you? <laughs> you know, I really don't know. I, I, uh, That's not what you say in the book. Well, I, I, I think he, uh, he had difficulty with me and they were concerned about me. 
um, because of, of my opposition to Suncor initially. This was the, the private oil company that yeah. the government purchased. The government purchased and uh, it was a, a bit of a story and it was an opposition issue and I, I ended up uh, in some respects naively uh, speaking against the purchase and that was quite a story at the time. And I think that from the Davis perspective and the people around him, um, uh, I think that unnerved them to some degree. And I know there was another issue when they were closing a facility in my riding that Frank Dre was, I think, the labor minister at the time. So they had a meeting with Frank Dre and, and the premier to talk about this closure. And they wanted to make sure that I was going to react appropriately. And uh, that's not in the book. Uh, but uh, I think that they were, and I, I was much more cautious about stepping out of line. I mean, I would express my views in caucus if, if I felt strongly enough about it. But in, and then, and I, 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 I think I explained in the book, it was more or less accidental. It was kind of a, uh, a city council kind of response where you're not tied into a party line. And I just expressed my concern about the government getting into the oil business. Well, Bob Eaton took it a little more personally than that, didn't no. he? What did he almost do? He, uh, he was another MPP in your caucus. Yeah, he was a, he was a member of, uh, of the cabinet without mm. portfolio. And uh, we had a, a reception, a caucus reception. And uh, I think Bob had uh, a little more had a few uh, beverages? liquid refreshment mm -hmm. and uh, was wanted to... Uh, more than verbally assault me. He tr did he not take a swing at you? He came close. He wanted to take a swing at me. He came towards me, and, and one of the other MPPs intervened and held him back. And uh, so, who knows what would have happened? Think you that, could have taken him? I don't know. Uh, uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> you do in this book call Bill Davis an authoritarian ruler. Yeah. Any? Uh, you feel comfortable calling him that? Well, I've been criticized for that, but I, I you know, uh, based essentially on that one decision. Separate school funding? Separate school funding issue and, and the way it was dealt with in the caucus when we were called into this special meeting and, uh, and uh, he indicated that he'd made this decision, felt it was appropriate that he only make this decision. This was extending public funding to the end of high school That's for right, yeah. Catholic schools, which at that point were only funded to grade 10. That's right. And, uh, and then he left the room and he didn't accept any discussion or questions. And then... Uh, How'd you feel about that? I think we were all uh, perturbed. And I, I remember I, I didn't get this directly from Beth Stevenson, who was, I think she was education minister at the time, that I'd heard she, she had said something uh, to the premier of the day about this issue, which was pretty strong. I don't think she was a fan of the idea either. Absolutely not. Yeah. She thought it was crazy. And... No. Uh, in any event, uh, and then we were told, ordered by the chief whip, to not only everybody get into the house, but when the premier makes this announcement, you all get up and give him a standing ovation. And did you? I did. Yeah. It, w one of the things I found interesting about your book was that you seem to have more difficulty with your fellow conservatives than you do with people in the opposition <laughs> parties. And I found that I, I found that intriguing because, yeah. you know, you talk about some of your best friends at the time, yeah. like Peter Cormos, yeah. a new Democrat MPP. Yeah. And a lot of the people that you save your toughest criticisms for are in your own family, are in your conservative family. For example, you're, you're, you're a sitting MPP. Yeah. It's 1987. And you get challenged by somebody for your own nomination. Yeah. Who challenged you? The fellow who succeeded me. <laughs> Steve Clark. Steve Clark, who's now the MPP for Leeds Grenville. Now, what did you think when he challenged a sitting MPP, which, you know, that's just not done. or it's, no. you, you know, I, was it's a former, I was a former cabinet minister, too. Right. So what did you think about all that? I was upset, but I kind of sniffed it uh, coming. I, and, uh, and Steve was more or less a rock star. Uh, and he was the youngest mayor, elected mayor in Canada, I believe. 20 years old, I think, when he got the job. 21, maybe. 21? But, uh, you know, and then I was, uh, I, there was a lady in the writing who was consistently stirring the pot in terms of uh, wanting to move me out of the role. And, uh, and she convinced Steve and, uh, to jump into the fray. And, uh, and you know, it was a real uh, serious challenge for me because he was so popular, personally popular, and uh, and it was a, a nerve-wracking time for me. There's no question about it. But you two became friends, and again, eventually, when he succeeded you as the member for that yeah. riding, you kind of you know laid hands on him, and everything was fine at that point. How did that happen? 
Well, I, I lost my executive assistant, went back to school, and uh, I looked around, and he was the most qualified guy in my view. And Steve had remained loyal to me and to the party uh, after his defeat and worked on my campaigns. And, and I thought, you know, that there's nobody that I was aware of in the riding who could do a better job. So I hired him as my executive assistant and it upset quite a few of my loyal supporters that I had done that. But I think over the long haul, I, it proved to be a, a wise decision and he's been an outstanding MPP. Now, the first pe question people are gonna ask when they see the title of this book is, how the hell did this guy get the nickname Mad Dog? Yeah. What's that story? Well, what happened, uh, there had been a couple of murders in my riding in, a, in an attempted sexual assault by people who were out on day passes from the uh, psychiatric facility in, in Brockville. We have a forensic unit there for criminally insane. And uh, the, these acts had been committed by people out on, on pass. So I raised the question about the, the processes involved in, in, in granting day passes, and I couldn't get any satisfaction from the government of the day, the liberal government of the day. And it was in the minority situation uh, where the NDP and our party held the majority on committees. So I took it to the, uh, the Public Accounts Committee where I was a member. And I talked to the MPP uh, NDP lead on the committee and talked to her about the process and what I was trying to do. And she agreed to support my motion to have the Auditor General take a look at this and uh, how effective or ineffective it was. So then we came to committee and um, and the NDP voted against me. And of course, I was extremely upset, thought I was betrayed. And uh, I expressed my anger. And it was on a Thursday, a private member's day, and the bells rang. And when that happens, the committees have to adjourn for the votes. So we immediately went out of the committee up to the House. And I carried on the, my haranguing of the individual member. And then a couple of her members uh, got involved supporting her and yelling at me. And then Dave Cook, who was the NDP House Leader at the time, started yelling, you're insane, Runciman, you're insane. And, uh, and then the speaker asked me to calm down, Hugh Hedegoffer, a great guy. And uh, I, I, I obviously had lost it. So he, uh, he did what he had to do and he had me removed from the chamber. And, um, and so that's the only uh, rationale I can, you know, think of where I got that moniker. As we've already talked about, people perceive you as being on the right-hand side of the Progressive Conservative yeah. Party. And yet when Mike Harris ran for leader of the party in 1990, yeah. you supported the kind of, you know, pinkish red Tory <laughs> Diane Cunningham for leader and not Mike Harris, yeah. which confused a lot of people. Yeah. But Mike, when he became premier five years later, put you in cabinet anyway. So how did that hatchet get buried? You know, I guess you'd have to ask Mike. I mean, I never had any trouble burying it. I, I don't think from my perspective, there was never any hard feelings about Mike. I just thought he was too much like me and too much like uh, Frank Miller, you know, smaller town, kind of more rural kind of guy, white male sort of thing, and, uh, and really not having any real appeal in urban Ontario. And uh, I've never been a, uh, you know, if you call me a right winger, it's more, it's more in dealing with the, the criminal justice issues and, and the victims of crime issues where I could be extremely, uh, and, a, and a very strong fiscal conservative as well. But a lot of these social issues, no. But it hurt me and I know it hurt Mike when we had that conversation about me supporting Diane Cunningham. And, uh, and uh, you know, he proved me wrong. There's no question about that. I've been proven wrong in a lot of leadership contests. <laughs> and uh, no, and Mike did a fantastic job as premier. And uh, you know, I think he, he, I was part of when we were in that uh, period uh, between uh, 90 and 95. And Mike brought me in as part of the management team of the caucus. And uh, so I was, you know, there was, I think only four or five of us. Uh, Ernie was the house leader. And Norm, Norm Sterling was the caucus chair and I was the chief whip plus a couple of staffers on that management team. So I think that helped as well, you know, and sort of, uh, and I think I did a very effective job as, uh, as a critic. Well, funnily enough, I have a quote here about those years. So let me read this quote. For me, you write, the 90 to 95 years were the most enjoyable of my 29 years in the legislature. We were a small band of warriors fighting very challenging odds and ultimately overcoming them. 
We worked and partied hard, and without a doubt, we outshone the Liberal official opposition. Yeah. It was a time when I made lifelong friends with fellow MPPs, PC caucus staff, and workers around the Queen's Park precinct. Wonderful memories. Yeah. Now, what surprised me about that was, you guys were kind of nowheresville in, in 1990 to 95. You yeah. became government, majority government, in 95, yeah. won again in 99, and yet you don't say that those were the happiest years, even though you were a, a, a senior cabinet yeah. minister at that time. How come? Well, government years are probably the most productive years in terms of accomplishing things in, in your own riding and in government for the province. But in terms of fun, you know, uh, and... I we noticed were, that party hard reference there. What would that be a reference well, to? We, we were in the north wing of the legislature and uh, a very small group. I think we got up to 19 members at one point. We won two by-elections with Chris Hodgson and Dave Johnson. And Diane Cunningham came in there as well at some point. And, uh, but we just, we really glued together, you know, and great friendships. I remember when I was first here, walking down the hall and one of the... Uh, cleaning staff or something said hi to me or something like that and and anyway Jeanette said to me you know Bob you always have to say hello and hi to everybody and no matter their standing or status and you know I never forgot that and I know when my daughter came to work here uh, in security team and they said you know your dad's so wonderful he talks to everybody and about this and that and it was a message that uh, <clears throat> I've, I've carried to this day. You learned that from your wife? Absolutely. You got appointed to the Senate by Stephen Harper, and you were in Parliament nine years ago when that lone gunman came in and shot up the place. Yeah. What do you remember from that day? Well, it was a scary time, there's no question about it, and I, I remember that I made a bad decision, a lot of us did, that we, we ran to the wall standing up, and my, my, my seatmate in there was Gord Brown, who was the MP for Leeds Grenville, and Gord and quite a number of others did the right thing. They laid down on the floor, and, uh, but it was scary and we had, an, I think, a half a dozen former police officers who were part of that caucus and they immediately ran to the doors, were putting chairs against the doors and trying to block any possible entry into the, into the room. And then, of course, the other big issue was that uh, they immediately uh, took the prime minister and put him in a sort of a little closet off to the side so that if a, a, a shooting, a shooter got into the place, that because the Prime Minister sits up above the caucus and he would have been highly visible and, and uh, vulnerable. And they did the right thing, but of course there was a lot of public criticism about him hiding, if you will, in a closet. But it was the right thing to do. And, uh, but those are the issues that I remember. And then I remember the uh, Sergeant at Arms coming in shortly after they escorted the Prime Minister out and saying that he'd shot the individual and killed him. And, but they still kept us in the room for hours afterwards while they went through the whole parliament center block to make sure there was no one else in there. But it was a memorable day, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, last question here. You spent almost 30 years in this building yeah. as a member of the legislature. Then how many years as a senator? Almost eight. Almost eight. I guess people are going to want to know, ultimately, that's a lot of time in public life. Yeah. Was it worth it? It was, and you know, um, I certainly think we accomplished quite a few things while I was in, in the legislature. But I think the things you really remember in terms of accomplishment, I introduced the funding for the families of, uh, you know, fallen public safety officers who lose their lives in the line of duty. So that pays their tuition and a limited amount of their costs at the university or college. So that's one thing I remember. And in the Senate, I was able to get four pieces of legislation passed Three of them are now Canadian law, which, you know, being only less than eight years there, and three of my initiatives are now Canadian law. You, you reflect on those things and the opportunities that it's given me in, in life and to meet people that uh, some of them are in the book that, you know, I never would have met uh, folks uh, like that if I hadn't been in, in, in the variety of jobs I've had in, in public life. So, no, it's... Uh, in many respects, been a, a wonderful experience. I can't knock it at all. From Mad Dog to Senator, <laughs> to doing interviews about his memoir. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it very much.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.